Our gospel reading is from the gospel according to John, chapter 21, reading verses 1 through 19. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. And another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Dear friends, grace and peace to you this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, So I like to listen to a lot of different teachers in the church, and one of my favorite right now is this guy named John Mark Comer. I quote him quite a bit the last several months. Uh, The thing about him, and this is probably probably why I like him so much, he teaches a lot on what's typically called spiritual formation. And if you're not familiar with that term, another, maybe the more biblical word for it would be the word sanctification, or the secular phrase would just be the phrase personal growth. Uh, Whatever we want to call it, the question that it's concerned with is how do people actually change? Uh, Maybe more fully, not just how do people change, everyone kind of changes over the course of their life, uh, but how do we actually grow and develop into the people that God has created us to be? Uh, How does the Holy Spirit work is a big part of that. Uh, How do we become more like Christ is kind of the end goal of it. Altogether, what does that process look like over the course of someone's life is the question of spiritual formation. You see, one of the things that Comer points out is for almost everyone, that's a lifelong process. Uh, Literally, no one is a saint right out of the gate, right? Uh, And in particular, what he says is that almost everyone uh, in their late teens, kind of early 20s, relatively new to the faith, is just going to be kind of like, eh, like, eh, just spiritually mediocre, is what he says. Not you, by the way. If you're in your 20s, you're a saint already. I know it. Uh, But no, he says that most 20-year-olds are smack dab in the middle of the bell curve. Uh, neither incredibly Christ-like over here, nor habitually horrible over here. 
uh, is where everyone starts. Uh, I don't know what you were like in your 20s, but when I was in my 20s, I was in seminary to become a pastor, and I knew in my mind, if only because I was studying theology, that I am obviously very saintly. <laughs> Me and Jesus, like we're like mere image, like I know you thought I was Jesus, I'm just kidding, no. Uh, and I'm very humble about it too at the time. Uh, but no, what happened is I got to my early 30s, I got married, we had three kids, all of whom are four and down, and it turns out, especially at three o'clock in the morning with a baby crying, typically waking the other two up, at which point the dog starts to pace the house wanting to be fed breakfast at 3 a.m. And what comes out of me in that moment, I gotta be honest, it's not very Christ-like. Um, patience is a struggle, right? Like, I wish patience would come sooner, and that's ironic, it's weird. Anyway, and so teens and 20s, we're all kind of middling, right? 30s and 40s, he says, uh, the hope, it's not a guarantee, but the hope is we're beginning to realize that we are, in fact, a work in progress. Uh, you see, what Comer then goes on to point out, and this is based on a ton of psychological data and also theological research. Now, he's very good. He's like a master at blending the two. Uh, is if you fast forward in your life, like 40, 50 years, so now you're going to be like 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s, uh, 90 years old. And he says at this point, instead of everyone being clustered, right, in the middle of the bell curve, uh, when it comes to the elderly, they are either some of the most calm, composed, and Christ-like people you will ever meet. And I'm sure you've met people like that. Uh, or he says, they are some of the most impatient, bitter, and selfish people you'll ever meet. Uh, have to get their way, think they deserve it, say words that wound everyone around them and just don't care. And I imagine you may have met people like that as well. And so even though we start at the middle of that bell curve, inev inevitably over the course of one's life, we move to the extremes. Uh, to put it in the words of C.S. Lewis, he used to say that in the end, all of us are either everlasting splendors or immortal horrors. Um, and just to be clear on this front, uh, this is not to put a judgment on anyone. If you're sitting there thinking, like, I know who I'm thinking about, right? Like, it's not to put a judgment on anyone. It's not my goal. Uh, it is rather to press a question on you and me this morning. In particular, I want us to think about what kind of trajectory are you on? In other words, who are you becoming right now? All of us are becoming someone. We're on some sort of path to our own formation. We can't help it. And the question is, if you were just to stay on your current path, I mean, the same way of handling your work, for instance, it's very formative of who you are, how you handle your work, the same way that you handle stress, the same habits at home, the same thoughts that you have, the same way that you speak about other people, your screen time. Uh, if you continue on that path of formation and you look ahead, let's say like 10 20 or 30 years down the road? Are you happy with the trajectory that you're on? Or perhaps, at least even in just some ways, you need to pivot onto a different path. Uh, I want to talk today about trajectories and pivots. And the reason for that is if you go to our passage, at the very beginning of the passage, Peter has put himself on a very specific trajectory. And yet what happens over the course of the passage, it's not a good trajectory, by the way, we're going to get into that in a minute, uh, but what happens over the course of the passage is Christ intervenes in Peter's life and he pivots him onto a different path. Uh, so we're going to look at both those things, both the trajectory that Peter has fallen into and the pivot that Christ comes in and makes. And so just to start with that trajectory, uh, it's right at the beginning of the passage, Peter says something that I think to us seems like just so simple, we run right by it and don't think anything of it. Uh, and yet it's actually indicative of a trajectory that his life has taken at this point. And what it is in particular, he says to the other disciples, you want to see it, it's verse 3 of the passage, he says, I'm going fishing. And like I said, it seems like an innocent or innocuous statement to us, and yet the thing about fishing is it has this huge significance in the Gospels. Specifically, it's at the very beginning of the Gospels, when Christ first calls the disciple, his disciples, he actually calls them out of fishing. Uh, if you remember the story, they're sitting in the boat, mending their nets, right? They're fishermen. By trade. You see, when Christ calls to them, he says, follow me and I will make you, what does he make them? Fishers of men. It's like a very famous plan where it's from fishermen to fishers of men. Um, what that's meant to indicate is he is changing the overall trajectory of their life in that instance. 
It's not just a new job that he's giving them, just to be clear. Uh, he's actually giving them a new purpose. Infusing their life with a new sort of meaning and goal. You could even say all of a sudden they have a new Lord or a new authority over their life. And what I mean by that is it's now the call of Christ that is controlling them and taking them where he wants them to go. Uh, whereas before, when they were just fishermen, it was just they got to decide that. And you could tell they decided on the basis of custom and comfort, like all of us do, right? Uh, meaning just whatever was familiar to them, whatever they naturally liked, uh, whatever they themselves wanted and chose, it was a very self-contained, self-chosen, you could even say self-centered existence that they had. And so you see, it was this major shift at the beginning of the Gospels where Christ calls them out of that and puts them under his lordship. And what that means, if you go back to today's passage, so that happened at the beginning of the Gospels. Today's passage is at the very end of the Gospels. And for Peter, at the very end of the Gospels, to just go back to fishing? Like, really? I'm going fishing. Like, that's where this is going to end up. Uh, he's not just going back to fishing in that moment. That's not all that's happening. And so what he's doing is he's going back to a path of life that Christ has called him out of. In other words, he's sliding back into old ways. Maybe more specifically, he's leaning out from the call of Christ. Maybe most of all, he's reclaiming his control over the direction of his life so that his life is no longer effectively controlled by the ever new call of Christ, but instead it's pretty much just run now by old ruts and routines. Uh, just fishing for yourself instead of fishing for men. The loss of purpose and passion I think is palpable in this passage. Uh, what about for you? Has anyone else just gone back to fishing? Uh, in the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, which if you've never read it before, I commend it to you. It's fantastic, the Screw Tape Letters. Uh, what it is, it's a fictional book about a demon who's trying to ruin the soul of a particular man. They call him his, their patient. Uh, and at a certain point, what happens is this man comes to faith and he begins to follow Jesus. And what's fascinating is the demon's boss, that would be Screw Tape, uh, he's writing these letters of advice to a lower level demon named Wormwood. But what he says about this man's conversion to Christianity is fascinating. He says this, he says, do not despair. Right? Don't despair that he started to follow Jesus. He says, for all of his habits of both body and mind are still in our favor. In other words, sooner or later, he'll go back to fishing. We can get him right back there. And it may not even necessarily be a conscious decision that you or I make to wind up back that way. And in fact, more often than not, at least in my experience, it tends to be just kind of more of a gradual slide where our trajectory at one point was graciously given to us by God, meaning we actually heard the call of Christ and we heeded the voice of God. We had a palpable sense of purpose, if not even passion. Uh, Lutheran passion, of course, is what I'm describing right now, like, which is very subdued and reserved, like no hands up, just very passionate. Uh, but no, uh, <laughs> Passion is not about being demonstrative, by the way. It's about deeply caring and being controlled by the call of Christ. So that's real passion. Uh, and such were some of us at one point. And yet, for whatever reason, and I don't think it's inevitable, but it certainly is very common, somewhere along that path, we take a step off. We pivot in a way where we start to stray, right? Do we not do that? Do we not all, at some point, begin to drift and become dry and find ourselves distant from Christ. And you see, almost every single time where we wind up when that happens is right back in those old ruts and routines. Uh, it's 